dear colleagues, good morning. I, I'm glad to see you here in such early morning. Um, warmly welcome you to our session dedicated to war in Ukraine. Um, as a national representative uh, for Ukraine uh, from Vapor, I'm very glad to chair this session. And first of all, I want to thank to Vapor Office for giving us this possibility to be here, uh, for giving uh, our researchers from Ukraine this possibility to become members of Vapor. Uh, my my special thank to my colleague from Extreme Scan, Yelena Koneva. Um, she sincerely helped Ukraine, help Ukrainian science, and she did all her best for this session to happen. Um, Ukraine is still showing off um, a rich scientific tradition and outstanding researchers. And we haven't stopped even those uh, terrifying days when the large scale war started. Um, we believe that collaboration and um, knowledge sharing, it's a powerful tool in addressing global challenges, uh, not only in Ukraine, but worldwide. So um, let's make this uh, session a hub of new ideas, um, a source of inspiration and uh, partnership. Uh, I wish you all productive discussion. I wish you all a good session. And uh, before we start, I want to admit that some of our male colleagues from Ukraine couldn't leave the country. So uh, they recorded their presentations and we will watch them here on the screen. Uh, also, we have um, online broadcast and a Zoom uh, recording. Uh, so maybe they will join us. Uh, all discussion we will um, have after all uh, speakers will finish their presentations because we have the limit of time. Uh, so after each of uh, presentation, we won't have uh, time for questions, but after that, we will discuss all the whole uh, session. So uh, let's get started then. And uh, the first speaker is uh, Tatiana Skripchenko from uh, uh, Rating Group. Uh, she is going to present, uh, uh, she's going to have her presentation named Social uh, Prediction and Planning of the Future, Victory, Peace and Recovery in Post-War Ukraine. Tatiana, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, as you see, my name is Tatiana Skripchenko, and I'm representing the Sociological Rating Group. Uh, I'm really grateful for being here and grateful for everyone for your interest to Ukrainian issue today. So we'll try to speak a bit about the most general things, most general changes that we see in our research in Ukraine. Since the beginning of the full Russian full-scale invasion into Ukraine, of course, the sociological research faced like crucial and very rapid extreme transformations in Ukrainian society. And, but still, despite all circumstances, we managed to start our research. And not only we, our Ukrainian sociologists and colleagues, and we in sociological group rating, we start uh, researching the Ukrainian society under the war conditions to investigate uh, like uh, what practices, what changes happen during the war in their life. Um, we have a lot of interesting sociological data and also psychological data due to our new established uh, rating laboratory, because of course, uh, during the war, we faced the need to investigate the psychological moods of Ukrainians, uh, like every day happening all these things. So. Uh, so we had a lot of data and also th we can deep our understanding of Ukrainian changes in Ukrainian society uh, thanks to our 25 uh, national waves that uh, like our self-finance of sociological rating group that we did. Uh, and like we stayed in Ukraine, uh, we did this research uh, We uh, from the first days, like for the very first days of the full-scale invasion. Uh, and we did it like just because we understood that not only our employees need it, 
but our society need it and in general country need it and the science, sociological science of Ukraine need this. So today uh, we will speak about uh, most general things from this, uh, our 25 national surveys. Yes. Uh, so one of the most important transformation that took place in Ukrainian society that uh, we managed to uh, to investigate was the growth of the confidence uh, in in nation and the growth of the self esteem of Ukrainians like the reassessment of achievements of nation uh, and like even comparing to other countries uh, when before the war we thought that we are like more than outsiders so now we are in the middle or even the leader if we speak about past Soviet Union countries uh, so we see the growth of this self-esteem and even two-thirds of Ukrainians they estimate the future pers perspective on the most higher level like the huge uh, level of optimism so why I'm speaking about this in uh, concerning the expectations is because uh, like this value of one's self uh, uh, self esteem it influences the higher expectations what we will have after the war. Uh, so now Ukrainians want to rebuild uh, things destroyed by Russia even better than it was before the war with the modernization. So they don't want to have the same as it was. They want to have it even better. Uh, and also, uh, we understand that like huge uh, resistance to Russia aggression, huge volunteer movement, uh, all this and international support also, all this influence uh, to the national pride that we see the, the feeling of the national pride growing in Ukrainian society, like the pride to be Ukrainian is much more higher than it was before the war. And the same thing if we talk about the self-identification, the national identity. Uh, according to our data, sure, the national identity uh, became stronger. Uh, and also, like, feeling yourself as Ukrainian, it's in the first place. And the second place is also feeling yourself as a part of European community. is also uh, grow uh, very much. And in the contrary, on the other side, the uh, concerning yourself as a Soviet person among Ukrainians, uh, is going to the lowest uh, lowest point as it ever was in the history of our observation. Um, moreover, the important thing I'd like to mention that it happened in all regions and among all age groups uh, in the society, uh, because like maybe for the regional differences, they were relevant before the war in Ukraine, especially if we talk about ideological language or international issues. But for now, uh, they're not relevant anymore because the union and one common enemy as Russia is united all regions and all age groups. So we see all the strengths in uh, doesn't matter what the group you are. Uh, and also uh, the common uh, thing that we see also in re regions on all age groups is the recognizing the Euro-Atlantic uh, vector of Ukraine as uh, the only possible one and the only right one. The, that's just something that we haven't seen before. So for today, we have the record number of respondents who say they support joining Ukraine, uh, United, uh, European Union and NATO. Uh, we saw the, like the first growth in 2014 during the first Russian invasion, uh, but uh, like of course the maximum level it, it reached uh, during now during the war being 80 percent and more. And what is important also that uh, never mind the region or age, uh, all Ukrainians, the majority of them, they assess the Ukrainian as accession to NATO as the best guarantee of the future. Um, of the future security against future Russian aggression. And, and sure, of course, even uh, despite the deterioration of economical situation, of psychological situation, uh, still people believe in victory and believe of uh, to our uh, possibility to beat the Russian attack. Uh, and, and you can see that for now it is even bigger than it was before the war. Uh, but during the war, we have like 90% and more. Um, and that's the huge conviction that Ukrainian armed forces are, are have a nice possibility and are, and are able to, in the end, to win in this war. But of course, we have not only optimistic trends, uh, but the same, uh, we, regarding the certain issues, we see the decreasing of several of them. During the war, our research lab laboratory started to 
uh, investigating the resilience index is like a com general resilience and psychological and physical. Uh, of course, during the war, uh, it is quite on the high level still, but uh, we see the decreasing of these measurements, especially in physical. Uh, and it it refers more about like the you have a bad a uh, bad uh, sleeping, uh, you don't feel well, you have a bad health and so on. Like everything is happened till today. Like even today, the Russia attacks several Ukrainian cities. So people like couldn't sleep well. And even the district of my friends was attacked. So that's why to be still uh, physical and psychological uh, brave, it's a bit, a bit hard. But uh, I guess we still managed to do this uh, since we live in Ukraine. Uh, and if we talk about the economical issues, of course, uh, due to the Our Ladies data, we see that the half of Ukrainians, they felt the economical deterioration um, in the past six months. And it is a bit better since it was in the first months of uh, the war. You can see this from the dynamics. Uh, but still, it's a, a huge problem, uh, which related also to work. And also, if we compare the Ukrainians in Ukraine and the Ukrainians abroad, uh, for yeah, refugees, it is a bit better situation since among Ukrainians, we see only a few percents who have improved their situation economical. And for uh, refugees, it's uh, almost like one third of those who felt and experienced the improvement of their uh, financial situation. Uh, so getting back to the work, uh, yes, sure, for today, uh, we see that almost 70% of those who had a, a job before the war, they are still working, uh, hopefully. But of course, one quarter still didn't find the job. The positive, optimistic uh, like trend we see is the growing of those who had a new job. Uh, who managed to find a new job during Ukraine. And uh, mostly uh, it happened among the internal displaced people, like those who live in other regions of Ukraine, and they managed to find a new job in new new region. Uh, and if we talk about the recovery, about reconstruction, also the the job here and the like future perspective is important issue uh, since uh, uh, now people realize that uh, of course, reconstruction won't be like in two or two or three years. They realize that it will take five or even ten years, and like every new attack postpone this uh, to 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 more time. And employment is still the the important factor. You can see that uh, along with the restoration, with the uh, restoration and damage repair of reconstruction, uh, people see the priority, the uh, restoration of business and jobs. They want to have uh, places where to work. And you can see that the, to have a place to work is even bigger priority rather than uh, direct financial support. So they can want to have a job like a source of income, but not just like a financial support. And the same also we can see in perspective of the role of foreign institutions in future reconstruction. Um, uh, mostly Ukrainians see the role of uh, international uh, institutions as a uh, financial support, of course, and also controlling role, those who are control this financial support. But uh, the reconstruction is set itself. Ukrainians think that it should be done by Ukrainian companies, like to leave uh, the money on the ground and for, to give the job for people to work and have an income source. Yes, and uh, to be short, I guess the last one, the concern in the uh, expectations of duration of the war. And uh, of course, because of uh, even taking into account the belief in victory and like good expectations, the expectation of duration of the war is more or less uh, moderate. Uh, for now, people understand that it still will be like half a year or a year. And uh, interesting thing, when we compare the survey of Ukrainians in Ukraine and Ukrainians in Europe uh, who live abroad, uh, we see some differences since the uh, refugees, they estimate uh, the duration of the war a bit more cautious, uh, maybe like postponing their returning back and thinking about the threats. Uh, while on the other side, the Ukrainians in Ukraine, uh, they have this belief in the fast victory, maybe also as a kind of a factor of stability that helps them to justify uh, their hope and to stay at home. So they hope that it will be sooner so that they uh, can justify why do they stay in Ukraine. 
And concerning the refugees, sure, this uh, uh, perception of uh, perception of the victory and how long it will take, it influences their intention to return. So uh, if they are thinking that it will be more than a year, of course, uh, they are thinking also about to, live, to stay in abroad for this year and start adaptation. Uh, of course, generally, a lot of things influence their intention to come back home. Uh, and it's too too huge like to experience, but we also did such uh, researches. So the opportunities like uh, economic opportunities, as we see comparing of Ukrainian and abroad, it influences their uh, their intention and their ability to find a job and their uh, the duration of stay in the country and also the region also because if we talk again about economical situation like in north regions, uh, refugees have a better situation than in Eastern Europe. But still, uh, each uh, their um, the situation is unique, and for now, like to, to I guess to make a finish. Uh, for now, uh, I would say that we think that to make in the research in Ukraine, the most right thing is not only survey Ukrainians in Ukraine, but to make a complex uh, research with Ukrainians in, staying in Ukraine, with in, internal displaced people, those who change the region inside Ukraine, and of course uh, refugees abroad. Only in this case. Uh, taking into consideration all of their expectations, we can manage to build an image what the future of Ukraine can be. Thank you. Good morning, colleagues. My name is Sergei Dimpitsky, and I'm the deputy director of the Institute of Sociology at the National Academy of Science of Ukraine. I regret that I couldn't travel to the beautiful city of Salzburg this year, but I hope that my video will make up for the inability to participate in this event in person. I will certainly be following the session's live broadcast, the presentations of my colleagues, and I'll be ready to answer questions either during the live stream or in the chat. My presentation is based on the data from the Sociological Monitoring Ukrainian Society, which the Institute of Sociology has been continuously conducting since 1994. The technical details will be available in the published report. The director of our institute, Evgen Golovaha, in his recent interview said the following My hypothesis is that people are eager for positive information regarding the war with Russia. In their perception, the situation has stalled, and Ukrainians don't want the normalization of the war. In this way, they are addressing their demands to the state. Let's do something to change the situation for the better. Indeed, judging by the assessments of the war's duration, the situation has stalled and no one desires the normalization of the war. At the same time, Ukrainians' attitude towards the state is a multifaceted phenomenon that goes beyond their demands from the authorities. In my presentation, I will offer a unique perspective on this issue. We measured people's view of the state using the GSR-5 scale, which looks at five factors – the effectiveness of central authorities, the country's future, living conditions for most people, the balance of achievements and setbacks since independence, and contentment with current national events. First, we will review each factor's responses. Then, we will analyze the overall stance towards the state based on these answers. The extensive Russian invasion of Ukraine brought substantial shifts in how people rated the effectiveness of central government bodies. By May 2022, a clear majority gave positive marks in stark contrast to the end of 2021, when only a small fraction did. Yet, subsequent surveys reveal a decline in positivity and a rise in neutral responses. In the most recent survey, negative and positive ratings are nearly on the same level. The wide-scale war has also brought about a notable rise in social optimism concerning the future of the Ukrainian state. Interestingly, this positive trend shows no significant signs of waning. Even though assessments of future prospects have slightly declined, the vast majority of respondents still maintain the belief that the situation will get better. Although not as dramatic, assessments of living conditions for most Ukrainians has improved. The sudden rise in national-level threats, along with Ukraine's surprising resilience, has led citizens to recognize that even during tough times, the population is generally living in satisfactory conditions. Subsequent changes, while following a downward trend, are not essential. 
Turning to the assessment of Ukraine's achievements and setbacks as an independent nation, the results have mostly remained steady. Similar to late 2021, during the conflict, a majority of respondents feel that failures and achievements have balanced out. However, in the latest survey, almost a third of respondents noted that failures were more prevalent. Satisfaction with current events has also stayed consistent. While previous assessments were mostly neutral, this time they lean more towards negativity. Additionally, a majority of respondents are dissatisfied with the current state of affairs. The methodology for constructing a composite profile consists of three steps. Using confirmatory factor analysis, hidden variable values are determined based on responses to the initial five indicators. Next, the distribution of these hidden variables is divided into five groups according to established criteria. In the final step, depending on which of the five groups the respondent's answer falls into, their composite profile is determined. Now let's see the aggregate results of GSR5 scale, which is based on answers on all five indicators. The dynamics of general attitudes towards the state allow us to see interesting features of Ukrainians' perception of their own state. As of the end of 2021, we see pathological negativism in the perception of the state. Two-thirds of the all respondents demonstrated either strongly negative or moderately negative attitudes. The war destroyed this dominant negativism, showing Ukrainians that if they lost their state, they would lose everything that was important to them. In the first measurement after February 21st, we see that negative attitudes decreased by more than three times, and positive ones increased by six times. Further changes indicate a gradual worsening of the situation, which is mainly facilitated by systemic negative processes associated with government officials and their subsequent assessment by the population. By and large, they didn't disappear even during the bloody and exhausting war. People's current views about the state form a social and political background. This background affects how they see other big social events and actions. If someone sees the state negatively, they will likely see other related things negatively too. If they are positive, they will see other things positively. With this idea in mind, let's see how views about the state change opinions on speaking freely about politics, trustworthy political leaders in Ukraine, trust in political parties and movements, voting choices, economy, fairness in society. Regarding views on the freedom to express political opinions, it cannot be said that general attitudes towards the state directly influence this. The majority of people believe that expressing political views is possible freely, except for those with a negative attitude towards the state. In other groups, those who believe in the freedom of political self-expression prevail. When evaluating the presence of capable political leaders in Ukraine who can effectively manage the country, the trends largely align with overall state-related attitudes. This is primarily shown through a consistent increase in the number of respondents who believe that Ukraine has effective political leaders. A clear illustration emerges in the context of electing the next president of Ukraine. The immensely popular figure Vladimir Zelensky garners unwavering support from respondents leaning neutral or positive towards the state. Interestingly, declining positive attitudes don't prompt choosing different candidates. Instead, they drive an upsurge in the protest electorate, still undecided in their choice. The situation becomes even more telling when evaluating the presence of political parties and movements that can be entrusted with power. In fact, as general attitudes towards the state consistently improve, assessments of political parties and movements noticeably shift for the better. It's surprising by changes in the assessment of the country's economy that occurred after the onset of a large-scale invasion are one of the aspects of solidarity with one's own state during the challenging trials of wartime. Moreover, another aspect is how general perception of the state relates to the assessment of its fairness. For instance, when people have negative attitudes towards the state, they often perceive it as unjust. Conversely, those who have positive attitudes consider it fair. Among those with intermediate views, opinions about the fairness of the state are divided roughly equally. Summing up my presentation, 
I want to emphasize that the war has made Ukrainians recognize the value of their own country more than ever. This has primarily manifested in an improvement assessment of governmental performance, a revelation of living conditions in a positive light, and a significant upsurge in social optimism. Thank you for your attention. Many thanks to Elena Koneva, who made our speech possible, and support Ukraine. Thank you. And now we are going back to Nika Yelizarova from Factum Group Ukraine with her research. Welcome, Nika. Presentation. Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Nika Yelizarova. I am researcher in Ukraine. I work in Factum Group Ukraine, market research agency. And today I'm going to present you results of the survey of Ukrainian refugees. It's a joint work with my colleagues, Olena Petrova, and Tatiana Shevchenko, and today uh, they are here in this uh, room with us. Uh, so, as you know, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has caused a mass displacement of Ukrainian people. Millions left not only their homes, but the country, and official numbers tell us that 6 million Ukrainians are still living abroad. To give you an idea of how many it is, just imagine, it's more than entire population of some European countries like Denmark or Ireland. It's almost as many people as live in Austria, the country we are today. Six million. Uh, it is expected that this war will have a huge impact on Ukrainian uh, demogra demographic situation. Uh, we expect that demographic gap will influence the country for many uh, years. That's why it is uh, so important to support Ukrainians abroad, to talk with them, to understand their pains, homes, and of course, intentions to return. Uh, before we proceed to results, a few words about our methodology, because it's quite a challenging task to survey those who uh, abroad, uh, to contact them and to uh, construct sample. Uh, fortunately, Ukraine is a digital country where almost every citizen uses the internet, especially if to talk about urban population and working age population. Factum Group specializes in online research and have the largest online access panel in Ukraine. So we contacted our respondents via email and surveyed those who are refugees. Uh, uh, the survey was, so today we focus on the most recent information that was gathered only one month ago. And uh, uh, one more uh, important information about target audience, it's male and female aged 18 to 55, those who before the war was an urban population of Ukraine. Uh, within the scope of study, we had to sample those who are still refugees at the moment of survey and those who have already returned. But today focus is on those who are still refugees. And if it uh, will be possible and relevant, we will provide some comparison with those who have already returned. Uh, so what is the survey about? Uh, our goal was to conduct uh, research that could be practically applied. Uh, that's why we contacted different Ukrainian organizations, Ukrainian scientists, uh, business, the government, and non-governmental organization, and asked them, what information about Ukrainian ref refugees do you lack in your work? Uh, we got a lot of requests, and uh, of course, I don't have enough time to present all the results today. That's why I will focus on the main question, main question that worries most stakeholders in Ukraine. How can we encourage Ukrainian refugees to come back home? So how, how to return them to Ukraine? 
Uh, of course, uh, it is a difficult question and uh, finding answers to this question is impossible without understanding three main things. Who stays abroad uh, stay still after one and a half year of war? What fears about the future in Ukraine they have and under what, they, under what conditions they are ready to return? And this is our agenda for next uh, 10, 10 minutes. <laughs> So uh, let's move on to the first uh, section. It's a profile of refugees. Uh, as you can see on this slide, most refugees are women because men uh, that are aged 18 to 60 are not allowed to uh, leave the country during wartime. A significant number of Ukrainian children are abroad because every second woman uh, now we brought with your children because safety of children is one of the most uh, trigger reason why people leave uh, the country. Uh, also, uh, demographic profile of refugees significantly dif differs from other population in terms of region uh, residents where uh, refugees live before the war. Half of Ukrainians are from east, a region that uh, located uh, near front lines and suffers the most from Russian aggression. Uh, Ukrainians are spread across Europe, more than 40 uh, countries and beyond Europe, but most found shelter in Poland and Germany. Uh, as you can see, uh, despite uh, the high education of Ukrainian refugees, uh, Many of those lost their job in Ukraine because of war, and uh, now uh, they often work abroad in low-skilled low, low positions. For example, it can be uh, cleaners if it's women, or construction worker if it's men. Nevertheless, as, as uh, Tanya said before, uh, many of Ukrainian refugees uh, feel themselves quite comfortable uh, abroad. And even half of refugees have a, a higher standard of living. Top three problems they faced uh, in Europe uh, and uh, abroad, it's the first one is language barrier. Uh, second one is uh, getting access to healthcare and uh, of course dealing with paperwork. Uh, and interestingly, that uh, healthcare is one aspect that Ukrainians started to value more in Ukraine after living abroad. And of course, we must mention the heartbreaking consequences of war for this uh, audience. Uh, now, every second uh, have friends or close acquaintances who died in the war, and every tenth has family members who died in this war. And uh, I hope that now we have better understanding who are Ukrainian refugees and we can proceed to next uh, station with uh, uh, fears that they have about the future in Ukraine. Uh, we didn't limit the respondents with any list and they could freely express their opinions. It was an open-ended uh, questions. And of course, there are a lot of answers. It's like uh, uh, fears from death of family members to nuclear strike. But we, our research identified three main group of uh, fears about the future in Ukraine. I will separately stop on uh, each one. The first and the biggest fear is this war will last a long time. Also, some people are afraid that uh, uh, Russia will uh, prevail. So this group of uh, fears is about that Ukraine may never be a safe place again as it was uh, before. Uh, secondly, there is concern that uh, corruption and embezzlement of uh, budget will uh, uh, continue. So uh, people are afraid that funds and money for recovery and reconstruction will end up in pockets of those of power. Uh, the third uh, uh, group of uh, fear is about economic uh, decline. People are afraid that it will be not possible to, f to find well-paying uh, jobs, that uh, uh, life standard of living will uh, decrease. So this group of fears is about uh, poverty in Ukraine. And uh, 
I believe that understanding this fear shed light on desire, desire to return, because now we see that almost 20% don't want to return, and another sort have mixed feeling about returning to Ukraine. And uh, I, I think we have five minutes, and we can uh, proceed to this last uh, section. It's about return uh, conditions. Uh, it's uh, logically follows from previous uh, two section, and of course, peace is the primary and fundamental guarantee of return. Forty-three percent ready to return only after the end of the war, and uh, as we can uh, uh, see, uh, is if you, uh, I I showed in uh, sections of fears that some. Um, refugees are afraid that even after peace deals, it could be a re-escalation of conflict. Ukrainians uh, do not trust Russia. That's why they expect not only peace deal, but international guarantees of uh, peace, from, for example, from NATO or European Union. But, but peace alone is not an absolute condition for uh, return. And... Uh, uh, within this study, we identified three other main groups of uh, factors of returning to Ukraine. Uh, firstly, I will focus on uh, first two, emotional and sentimental ties and uh, challenges of adapting to life abroad. Uh, generally, life abroad is uh, accompanied with a large share of this range of negative emotions, uh, starting from longing for home and uh, family, and even to feeling of uh, uh, loss of uh, dignity and even guilt that you are not in Ukraine with your uh, compatriots. So uh, this emotion can be a powerful force that pushed Ukraine to return to Ukraine. And another factor, it's challenges. So, some, uh, so for someone, it is very difficult to adapt and uh, to live in other uh, country and culture. And but what th these are factors are really significant. But what them apart from others from sort is that they have already played their role after one and a half year of war. Uh, six out of ten refugees have come back to Ukraine precisely due to this factor, especially emotional. And for those who still abroad, the sort factor is critically important. So it's. The third factor is about opportunities and prospects within uh, Ukraine. Uh, nine out of ten will consider the prospects in Ukraine when deciding to return. And uh, what is uh, more remarkable, uh, almost 25% are ready to return before the war if they will have opportunities and prospects in Ukraine. And uh, if we talk about a brighter future in Ukraine, what is uh, for Ukrainian refugees? As you can see on this slide, this slide there are three main uh, factors. So uh, uh, it's a well-paid uh, work, economic situations that propose stability and prosperity, and the third factor is success in the country's reform. We provide uh, ref refugees, our audience, with 14 different reforms and ask them to uh, choose the most important. And uh, most of them, uh, most of them, I agree, on main two reforms. The first one is fighting corruption. And the second is uh, reforming of uh, judicial uh, system. What is interestingly, uh, according to our other studies in uh, Ukraine, these reforms are not only important for refugees, it's also important for those who live in Ukraine. And uh, I, I, as, as we can uh, all understand that these choices emphasizes the shared commitment of Ukrainians to European values, including justice and the rule of uh, war. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Nika, Elena, and Tatiana for your research and for your presentation. Thank you so much. And we're moving on to the next speaker. Uh, it's um, uh, Inna Valasevich, Deputy Director in the Sapiens Ukraine. Mm -hmm.
Good morning, dear colleagues. Uh, my name is Inna Volosevich. I am Deputy Director of InfoSapiens Research Agency. I am very happy to be here and I am very grateful to Elena Koneva for the invitation to the conference. So I will present you the research both in Ukraine and in Russia on the mirror image of the warring sides. Uh, all the surveys in my presentation in Ukraine will be based on InfoSapiens Omnibus with sample size of 1,000 respondents. And all the surveys in Russia are based on Chronicle survey by ExtremeScan with sample size of 1,600 respondents. All the surveys are conducted via KT based on a random sample of mobile telephone numbers. Uh, so, we have asked Ukrainians, if you had the opportunity to send a short telegram to ordinary citizens of Russia, what would you write? And uh, I was really surprised uh, with the results of um, a relatively low uh, share of the anger telegrams. There were telegrams like follow the Russian ships and so on, but you see that uh, it was a relative minority of telegrams and uh, majority of telegrams expressed calls to come to their senses. Open your eyes, start thinking, fight against your power, fight against the war. Also, there were a few persons of positive telegrams uh, that uh, ordinary uh, ra ra Russians can't be blamed in war and even that we are one nation, but there are only 1% of respondents who wrote such telegrams. Uh, if we divide uh, the telegrams in these three groups, we see uh, that 69% uh, of the telegrams are calls to come to their senses, 27% are anger telegrams, and 4% uh, are positive telegrams. And if you compare these results to April 2022, you see that, the share, that in uh, 18 months of uh, the war, uh, the uh, uh, anger telegrams increased only by 3%. Uh, so um, Ukrainians uh, uh, still believe that ordinary Russians can change the situation in, in uh, their country. Uh, at the same time, 83% of Ukrainians believe that ordinary uh, Russians are to be blamed for the invasion. But uh, they, uh, they uh, believe that uh, ordinary citizens can change uh, something. That's why the share of the uh, negative anger telegrams is so low, in, in my opinion. But Ukrainians and Russians have different locus of control. Uh, we have uh, asked uh, on this slide, uh, there is um, an, uh, how can you influence on your own life in 10 point scale? And you see that 36% of Russians think that they cannot even influence on their life and versus 18% of Ukrainians. And also 53% uh, of Ukrainians, even in the time of external aggressions, believe that they can uh, influence on their life uh, versus 38% of Russians. Uh, also in April 2022, we asked, uh, uh, would uh, would you stop? Um, do you think Russia should seek the surrender of the Ukrainian army uh, or uh, uh, the uh, the mili so-called military operation should be stopped, regardless of the surrender? And 30% of Russians uh, answered that it should be finished as soon as, as possible. But there is again uh, a question about locus of control. When we ask uh, if the further development of the military operation dependent on you personally, would you stop the military operation? Only 19% said that they would stop it. So it's uh, uh, about 40% of those who were against so-called military operations, they would not stop it, it uh, if it depended on uh, the, themselves. So what have Russians uh, written to Ukraine? 
uh, it was also a surprise to me uh, because most of the telegrams were the word of support. Hold on, everything will be fine. Take care of yourself. We are one nation. Russia has come to free you. Uh, Russians wish you well. <laughs> And uh, it's for me. It's like uh, live uh, oral that uh, uh, that uh, freedom is slavery, uh, war is peace, and evil is good. I I can read some of these telegrams to you. Hold on, friends. Help us to liberate uh, your own land from fascism. Hold on. We will come soon. We will save everyone. Do not listen to your people. You will be fine. We have never offended you. Do not make the enemies of Russians. We are your neighbors. Putin is good. We will support and protect you. And uh, only 3% of the telegrams uh, reflected clear support of Ukraine, which is uh, not all Russians support these operations. There are Russians on your side. Uh, so if we compare uh, Russian and Ukrainian telegrams, you see that 51% uh, of Russian telegrams were so-called positive <laughs> and 32% uh, were calls to come to their senses and uh, only three telegrams uh, reflected anger, which is really weird in, in the situation of war. Uh, and only also 3% uh, contained uh, true support of Ukraine. Um, so uh, even uh, in, in February 2023, 66% of Russians consider Ukrainians as war beneficiaries, that Ukraine will benefit from the Russians' victory. That is the explanation of the telegrams. Uh, also, um, at least a year ago, uh, most Russians even didn't understand that uh, Ukrainians consider them as enemies. Why do you think Ukrainians mostly flee to the European countries and not to Russia? Only 36% said that they consider Russia as enemy. Others named some reasons, uh, other reasons. Uh, so most uh, Russians uh, don't feel moral responsibility for the so-called uh, military operation. Uh, Fifty percent don't call the uh, don't feel the moral responsibility, and forty-two percent feel the moral responsibility. And uh, interesting that among those who support uh, so so-called uh, military operations, uh, relative majority do not feel moral responsibility. Uh, while those who among those who don't support military operations, um, fifty-three percent feel moral responsibility, though they don't support it. Um, also, um, uh, uh, our colleagues have asked whether you would support the Putin's decision to withdraw troops. And uh, thirty, it's Putin decisions, but uh, thirty-nine percent of Russians said that they would not support this decision, and thirty-nine uh, percent uh, would support. Probably this is the maximum figure of uh, people who can be uh, more or less against the war. Um, uh, one of the reasons why 39% uh, percent of Russians would not support uh, the Putin's decision to withdraw troops is because they are afraid on Ukrainians attack of Russia. 56% uh, of Russia believe that Ukraine will attack Russia and the qualitative surveys um, uh, show that it is not about occupied areas of Ukraine and it is not about Crimea, that people really um, are afraid that after all crimes which uh, Russians performed in Ukraine, that uh, Ukrainians will come for them. Uh, most Russians uh, feel the sense of justice about so-called military operations, 
and uh, interesting that among those who think uh, that Ukrainians and Russians are one nation, 72% feel uh, the sense of justice. It's rather logical that uh, they uh, feel that it is uh, just that the reunion of uh, the Russia is justified. But even among those who don't believe that Ukrainians and Russians are one nation, uh, 57% uh, feel the sense of justice of of this war, uh, probably they think that the uh, invasion of other lands are justified. And only 15% uh, of Russians feel the shame. 70% uh, of Ukrainians and 27% of Russians reported improved attitude to all nation as a result of the war. Uh, so we have asked uh, both Russians and Ukrainians to, main, uh, to name several main features that characterize uh, Russian people in, in general. And um, uh, most uh, they have uh, named that they are good and kind. It's also noticeable in, in the situation of war. And as for the Ukrainians, most Ukrainians named unity. We all now uh, feel that our country is uh, united faced the Russian invasion. And I think that before the war, nobody would would even name unity because there is even a Ukrainian pro pro proverb that uh, two Ukrainians are three kings. But now we feel that we all are united in our fight uh, against against Russia. Uh, so if we compare the Russian characteristics of uh, themselves and the Ukrainian characteristics, uh, you see uh, that um, mostly the good attitude towards others uh, was named. R Russians named it more often than Ukrainian, but Ukrainians named uh, twice more often leadership characteristics as bravery, uh, strong, brave, firm, heroic, and so on. Also, 6% of Ukrainians named desire for freedom as a national feature, and no one Russian certainly named it. Um, uh, also, if we compare uh, the trends in uh, Ukrainian characteristics of themselves, you see that in July 2023, even more Ukrainians uh, named uh, leadership features as brave, strong, heroic, firm, uh, and so on. Uh, also, we have asked uh, Ukrainians uh, to characterize uh, Russians, and uh, again, the uh, the most prevalent characteristic was stupid, not cruel, not aggressive, uh, but stupid. This is also the explanation of the prevalence of uh, the telegrams about calls to their senses. Uh, also, uh, as for now, 68% um, of Ukrainians are, will it, are willing to put up armed resistance to stop Russian occupation. And you see that despite of the tiredness of war, these figures uh, uh, almost uh, uh, doesn't change from March 3-4 uh, uh, when we have conducted the first survey in, in the wartime. Uh, also, the share of Ukrainians who are willing to contribute the incomes uh, to army increased, uh, even increased, uh, in, in spite of the fact that many Ukrainians have contributed a lot to army. This is connected to the uh, recovery of Ukrainian economic, which you have also observed on uh, in the slides on my uh, colleagues. And also 91% uh, uh, of Ukrainians are sure in liberation of territories occupied in 2022 and 83% of liberation of territories occupied uh, before. Thank you for your attention. I will be glad to answer your questions after the conference. Thank you, Ina, for your interesting research. Thank you. And now we are moving on to the next um speaker it's recording speech from um uh, of our uh, director of alex shulga director of the institute of conflictology 
analysis of Russia with his significant research that he provides in Russia but from Ukraine. First of all, thank you for this opportunity to share our results, uh, to discuss them. It's always very useful. It's our goal. My name is Alexander Shulga. I'm a doctor of science. Uh, I proudly represent the Institute of, for Conflict Studies and Analysis of Russia. ICAR is a non commercial, non-partisan, non-governmental think tank. Specifically at the core of our scientific attention are the following subjects. Exploring public opinion of Russian society and its, its attitudes towards the war against Ukraine, mobilization in Russia, uh, understanding of the war goals by ordinary Russian citizens and their acceptance, readiness to support a military aggression against other neighboring countries, including the NATO members, support of rocket uh, attacks against critical Ukrainian infrastructure facilities, etc. Russian society's readiness to endure war consequences, including human losses, casualties, economic problems, international isolation, are in a special focus of our research as well. We publish our results so anyone could use them freely. Our sociological monitoring is called the Mirror of Russia. It is conducted in strict accordance with the scientific methodology. We use a sample size of 1,600 respondents, addressed by the way of the computer-assisted telephone interview. Each monitoring has constant blocks of questions, which are included into every questionnaire, as well as questions uh, included every two, three months. And for each survey, we insert questions concerning urgent issues. As for now, we have uh, conducted six ways of the monitoring from December 2022 till June 2023. So, my presentation is called Seven Features of Present Russian Society, First Conclusions of Monthly Sociological Monitoring, Mirror of Russia. So, of course, there are a lot of features uh, uh, with, uh, who, with which we can describe Russian society. I would like to uh, to speak uh, about this particular seven features. So the first feature is so-called split consciousness of the Russian society as a condition for acceptance for all government actions. There are various ways to describe Russian public consciousness. Uh, it could be split consciousness, ambivalent consci consciousness, or even schizophrenic consciousness, using the term of uh, uh, Timothy Snyder. Regardless of the term used, uh, these concepts uh, encompass the same idea, a simultaneous acceptance by a significant portion of Russian society of multiple con uh, contradictory beliefs, facts uh, and explanations. This is particularly evident in how Russian citizens perceive the war against Ukraine, the co its causes and its future prospects. Official propaganda finds itself in direct conflict with the everyday experiences of Russian citizens uh, on this matter. So, the first wave of the All-Russian Sociological Survey conducted in December 2022 already provided us with striking examples of this state of split consciousness. In respondents' answers, uh, there were um, a lot of evidence. So, so, big, so subsequently, uh, months' uh, surveys also provided us with additional uh, information. In every nationwide survey, uh, when asked about the direction in which things are uh, heading in the Russian Federation, up to 69% of respondents indicated that they believe things are moving unambiguously or rather in the uh, right direction. At the same time, uh, one of the primary concerns for a considerable majority of Russians is what the Russian Federation refers to as the special military operation, its euphemism for the war against Ukraine. In essence, Russians consider the conflict to be one of the most pressing issues for themselves and their country. Unlike financial problems, the quality of medical services uh, or the condition of roads, this war is viewed as an unconventional and artificial problem. They expressed concern over a significant problem that they were not aware of until about a year or a year and a half ago. Yet they believe that their country is moving in the right direction. Uh, there are also additional numerous examples of uh, split consciousness within Russian society uh, that have been do documented in monthly national-wide survey of the Institute for Conflict Studies and Analysis of Russia. 
For instance, three quarters of Russians claimed to know the goals of the so-called special military operation. However, when we presented various options in the survey for what the goals were, none of the options garnered more than 39% of the respondents' support and more often uh, than not even 8-9%. Such contradictions between propaganda and personal experiences, coupled with the inability of official interpreters to explain various events and processes related to the war, are indeed numerous. Nevertheless, at this stage, uh, these contradictions do not uh, completely supplant uh, one another. The con uh, contradiction between the propagandist narrative and the official policy's reality is not an in some uh, surmountable uh, problem. Instead, there's two uh, uh, contradictory uh, facts. Um, they uh, come into d dissonance in the public consciousness. This phenomenon is fundamental for all other um, uh, features of Russian society. Second feature is called post-truth as a condition of Russian society and uh, the absence of alternative authorities. One of the consequences of the emerging of uh, split consciousness within Russian society is the lack of moral and political authority for a significant number of citizens who don't align with the current Russian establishment. The reasons for this are well known, ranging from the systematic and long-standing repression uh, of the opposition to divisions and political ambitions among opponents of the current uh, regime themselves. The dichotomy constructed by the Kremlin over the years, particularly after the annexation of Crimea and the invasion of Donbass in 2014, either you are with us or you are against us, leaves no room for cultural figures to remain outside the political process and maintain their authority. With the start of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, this fundamental ethical distinction has become even more pronounced, especially in relation to a few moral authorities from arts and culture who are either pushed out of the country or pressed to support the war of aggression as many of them actually have done. As a result, there is not a single political leader among Russian citizens who enjoys significant support even uh, when considering the so-called spiral of silence and uh, in respondents' answers. Nearly, nearly three quarters of respondents are unsure whom to award uh, for in an election without Putin's candidacy uh, on the ballot. The remaining portion is uh, divided between pro-governmental and uh, quasi-opposition candidates. For example, Evgeny Prigozhin, the owner of the Wagner private military company, was one of the politicians most frequently mentioned by Russians as a 2022 discovery, second only uh, after Ramzan Kadyrov. Meanwhile, singer Alla Pugacheva, who was uh, very popular since Soviet times and spoke out against the war, was mentioned by only 5% of respondents. Her husband, Maxim Galkin, received 3% percent of mentions and Russian opposition figures imprisoned for their political views, including criticisms of the war, scored even fewer mentions, 2 to 3 percent. Third feature, criminal mentality is as a norm in Russian society. Uh, indeed, split consciousness is not the only term that can be used to describe the current social consciousness in Russia. A significant uh, portion of Russian society exhibits a phenomenon known as criminal mentality. This does not imply that uh, all of them are criminals, but rather uh, refers to their attitude towards the law. While they formally acknowledge the importance of following the law at all times, or in most cases, a considerable portion of Russian society uh, tends uh, to prioritize truth as a central argument, uh, suppressing the boundaries set by the law. The primacy of truth over law raises the question of how Russian society understands truth. This fundamental question should serve as the basis for theoretical interpretations in a range of new sociological studies encompassing both quantitative and qualitative approaches. Understanding truth is a significant indicator influencing Russian citizens' perception of their state's war against Ukraine and their attitude towards the law. When asked about adherence to the law, the vast majority resp uh, responded that it should always or mostly be uh, abided by uh, the citizens. However, when asked which statements they personally prefer between 
power is in the law, it should always be adhered to, and power is in the truth, even if it violates existing laws, the majority choose the second portion. Some 61% of respondents believe that power primarily is in the truth, while only uh, one-third, 35%, responded that power is in the law. As a consequence of the prioritization of truth or even post-truth over the law and the lack of trust, the majority of Russians, 55%, do not believe the country should recognize an international tribunal on the Russian Federation. This sentiment is widely shared among both the younger and older generations. Moreover, almost three quarters, namely 78% of the Russian citizens believe that if the country is found guilty and uh, reparations are awarded to rebuild Ukraine, the authorities should not comply with the de decisions, as doing so would demonstrate Russia's weakness. Thus, the law takes a backseat to Russian post true despite the fact that the Russian Federation has violated international law. Enforcing the law uh, in the context of admitting guilt and paying reparations contradicts the cult of force which is also an integral part of the criminal mentality. Fourth feature is called assimilation and occupation as a sole models uh, of interaction and coexistence with neighboring countries. There is a socially accepted uh, model in the Russian uh, Federation regarding Ukraine, and not just Ukraine, that can be described as a subordination domination model rather than a model of cooperation. As a result, the objective uh, in relation to Ukraine is assimilation and absorption rather than mutual uh, exchange and coexistence. Here are some figures to illustrate this. After a year of a full-scale invasion of Ukraine, with tens of thousands of Ukrainians killed and wounded and hundreds of settlements destroyed, the majority of Russians, namely 65%, claim that they and their attitude towards Ukraine hasn't changed. Furthermore, over half of the respondents, 54%, still believe that Russians and Ukrainians are one nation, while an additional 12% believe that both nations are very similar to each other. Only 8% state that Russians and Ukrainians are completely different people. These figures may appear puzzling after so many deaths on both sides, including among Russians. How can its citizens maintain attitudes towards Ukrainians, Ukrainians that are largely unchanged from before the full-scale invasion in February uh, 2022 and at the same time consider Ukrainians the same people as Russians. The absorption assimilation model helps to explain this uh, discrepancy. The majority of Russian society implicitly perceives the invasion of Ukraine as an internal Russian matter, akin to the imposition of constitutional order in the Chechen Republic during the 90s and early uh, 2000s. If Russians and Ukrainians are essentially indistinguishable and belong to the same people, then the invasion is not seen as an aggression against a sovereign state and the act itself is not considered uh, an attack, but rather the establishment of order. Uh, consequently, Russia is not uh, viewed as an aggressor country. Fifth uh, feature of Russian society is called deep-rooted conspiracy mentality and anti-Americanism as a justification of all uh, Russian crimes. Another phenomenon in Russian public consciousness uh, that influences the perception of Russian citizens regarding the war against Ukraine and poses a long-term term danger to future peace uh, is the presence of a conspiracy mentality intervened with uh, anti-Americanism. Uh, the significance of this phenomenon cannot be uh, overstated as it is uh, uh, equally important for the post-war world alongside the previously described phenomena of split consciousness, criminal mentality, the subordination, domination model of coexistence with Ukraine and neighboring countries. Uh, as well as the lack of empathy among the majority of Russian citizens. 43% uh, of Russians believe that the Russian army in Ukraine is direct, directly engaged in a war against native forces. This narrative is promoted by official Russian propaganda. It also provides an explanation for Russians seeking reasons for the unexpectedly protracted Russian-Ukrainian conflict.
From their perspective, it is one thing to be unable to defeat Ukraine alone, especially since the Russian version denies Ukrainian uh, status as a legitimate state. However, it is another matter to be engaged in a conflict with the entire NATO, even if it is on Ukrainian soil. Consequently, this becomes another justification for Russian citizens absolving them of guilt for unleashing and waging a war of aggression. This argument follows a slightly different uh, logical thread than the subordination domination models previously mentioned. It is rooted in the inherent, uh, uh, innate uh, anti-Americanism that dates back to Soviet times along with the anti-NATO sentiment which serves as the basis for interpreting any Russian actions as a response to aggressive actions by NATO. Based on the perspective, uh, it is not the Russian Federation that uh, attacked a neighboring state, uh, state, but rather NATO that has threatened Russia's borders, nece necessitating military action by Russia. This perception is directly confirmed by Russians' responses to the, questions, uh, to the question of who instigated the war and who had an interest in it. Nearly three quarters of respondents agree with the view that the war was a trap set by the U U U United States for Russia, precisely what official Washington desi uh, desired. Consequently, the Russian Federation didn't start the war, but was uh, forced uh, to answer to aggressive NATO and America. Six Fisher uh, is called War is a New Covid. Uh, this is ne uh, the next important uh, conceptual aspect is, is uh, 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 concerning Russian society and uh, it is routinization of Russian aggression for Russian uh, citizens. This phenomenon has many indicators. One striking example is the dynamics of the answers to the question regarding the most urgent problems for the respondents from December 2022 to the present day. While in December 2022 a relative majority named the war as the most urgent problem and all other problems gained half or three times as many votes, as time went uh, on the problem of war began to align with other more traditional difficulties such as financial problems or roads, etc. etc. Thus, from the category of new and artificial problems, it gradually and inevitably moved into the category of habitual problems. Together with uh, habitualness, the pro this problem uh, is also occurring and uh, uh, definition uh, by Russian citizens as a natural disaster or pandemic, a phenomenon that they cannot influence and that can only endure by adapting to it. One's own uh, or, or relatives or friends mobilization is perceived, perceived as a risk of contra uh, contracting COVID, uh, also risk of death. In addition uh, to the explicit of, uh, or uh, some consciousness desire of, of Russians to shift responsibility for the inaction or support of the war onto external forces or force majeure, another aspect of this analogy is the positive example of existing under such extraordinary circumstances and the experience of ultimately reducing its impact to nearly zero. If we have survived a pandemic, then we can also endure a war against a neighboring state, especially if it is not uh, regarded as a war at all, but rather a special mil military operation. Last but not least, a uh, seventh feature of Russian society I would like to discuss today it's war inertia, the Russian public's disposition to support wars against its immediate neighbors and NATO countries. The ability to accept the uh, reality of an aggressive war against Ukraine, which pays, uh, posed no threat to Russian national security, paves the way for Russian society to accept the unleashing of a new war against any nation, whether a NATO member or not. Merely 15 to 16 percent of Russians uh, would under no circumstances support a so-called special military operation against the Baltic states, for example. Uh, other respondents pre uh, present uh, various uh, arguments to justify their willingness to support uh, the authorities in waging a new war. The most prevalent argument is the scenario of an attack or a threat of an attack on Russia by the Baltic states, which is deemed uh, sufficient by 54% of Russians to justify military action against them. In second and third place, by a wide margin, are arguments such as the oppression of the Russian-speaking population uh, in these countries and labeling their leadership as Nazi. 
Um, in other words, the majority of Russian society is prepared to endorse a new war of aggression based on the same arguments, claims of an attack, oppression of Russian-speaking citizens, uh, and labeling the political regime as Nazi, while copy Russian uh, propaganda narratives and serve uh, as justifications for the war against Ukraine. The same pattern emerges regarding the willingness to support a special military operation against Kazakhstan, since only 17% of respondents would unequivocally reject the decision under any circumstances. The same uh, with other countries, uh, for example, the vast majority of Russian society is prepared to accept the same justification as for the Baltic states, or Poland and even Georgia. The inertia of, of the current war uh, is such that its uh, gratuitousness and injustice serve as a blueprint and foundation for future conflict. It is not necessarily the case that these wars will be unleashed by the current uh, Russian regime. Uh, they could be unleashed by a subsequent regime. In either case, Russian society will be uh, ready for them. Thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward for fruitful discussion. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> you are watching us. Um, now the part one of our session is coming to the end and I invite all speakers presented here, uh, here uh, for a productive discussion. Um, all of those who want to uh, ask some questions can raise uh, a hand and we'll give a mic to you and you can ask a question. I, I hope uh, Alex and Sergei are remotely here, but... Uh, like, oh. Clifford Zanis, uh, Newark, NRC, University of Chicago. Uh, obviously, this is a uh, very depressing um, but um, I guess my main que my question is most uh, to InfoSapien and to uh, um, and to the gentleman who just spoke now. Um, to what extent do we trust some of these responses? I mean, in in a quasi police state, you know, why would anybody risk uh, incriminating themselves uh, on a on a telephone line? to say that they're against anything Russian. Um, that's uh, just a general question. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there, but any, anything you want to elucidate, uh, I just, uh, you know, wonder. Okay, so that was the, the question for specific uh, uh, research or presentation or? Hmm? Alex, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, maybe Ina, who who was you know first presenter of uh, yeah, Russia related data, she, she, she could well. start, and you know I can follow her arguments also. Okay, thank you for the question. So first of all, that's why our colleagues ask indirect question. For example, uh, would you support Putin's decision to withdraw troops? There is no risk for the respondents to ask either ways. And that's why these uh, indirect uh, questions, they help us to understand uh, hidden public opinion, uh, which cannot be measured in Russian by direct question. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with this argumentation. That's actually what we do during uh, our surveys. We uh, don't even try to ask those direct questions, uh, support of Putin's regime, support of his party, trust in Putin, etc., etc. We also um, uh, we also use specific uh, terms. Uh, for example, don't use the term of war. We uh, in in each our survey we. Uh, use only this special military operation. We use, uh, um, you know, th those terms uh, which are not suspicious or dangerous uh, uh, under specific conditions of uh, present Russian Federation. Uh, and yeah, we, we asked uh, our respondents uh, about their everyday life. Uh, and, uh, you know, we asked them 
very simple questions. For example, do they have someone conscripted or not? It's it's yes or not. Do they have someone killed in action? Yes or not? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So um, this is our approach, and uh, uh, I am happy to, to hear that our colleagues have the same approach as we uh, use. Uh, and you know, uh, it's it's uh, quite. Uh, popular question you know i frequently frequently ask question uh after our presentation so uh, another uh my frequent answer is then uh when i uh, listen to audits of this uh, computer assisted telephone interview so they are recorded of course um uh, actually our respondents are quiet and some sometimes very or too talkative so they really, you know, start answering questions. Um, you know, it's not yes or not uh, with with the answers. They they try to to uh, share their view uh, on the topic. They they really very talkative. They use emotions. They, they express emotions. So I wouldn't say that uh, that uh, they are somehow oppressed or somehow, you know, closed uh, and wouldn't uh, answer our questions. Yes, of course, we have um, like certain problems with response rate. Uh, who hasn't those problems? Of course, some some respondents uh, become suspicious and, for example, interrupt interviews. Who hasn't those problems? But uh, in general, um, for now, we don't uh, experience this, you know, um, unwillingness of the respondents to answer, to talk, uh, and to express their feelings, uh, assessments, etc. So, yeah, the, our general, uh, you know, uh, shortly we don't use direct questions. We try to ask respondents uh, about their everyday life. We try to ask simple questions. And we try not to be suspicious and not to put in danger our respondents with our questions. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, for your deep, deep answer. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Colin Irwin, University of Liverpool. Our second speaker had a very revealing uh, bar chart which indicated a, a degree of opt uh, pessimism just before the invasion, which then came into some quite strong optimism of some kind when obviously the Russian invasion was held back. And then now over time coming into the second year of the war, that degree of optimism doesn't seem to be quite so strong. So, uh, which, which makes perfect sense. Um, and I'm just wondering, do we have any similar data uh, tracking over time of Russian opinion um, or did the Russian uh, propaganda machine completely sort of wash out any uh, realistic understanding of the failures and uh, of, of the Russian military uh, um, activity? Do we have anything, a mirror of that? It's for uh, second, uh, you mean for second research about uh, optimism, pessimism, yeah? Or... Yeah, yeah, but uh, could you please uh, switch on the sound, Sergei? The... We can't hear you. It was it was question about Russian opinions, not yeah, about opinions. We we don't provide yes. uh, research in uh, about Russian optimism. No. Mm -hmm. That way, being being a researcher for Russia, maybe I can briefly answer. Uh, it's yes, it's it's, it's an exciting, in, interesting uh, phenomena that uh, attitudes in I, I mean in Ukraine that attitudes to very many things, even even economy, which is estimated in uh, higher <clears throat> and better now than even before the war. But that that that, that, is, that is a consolidation phenomena where domination of the war. Uh, bring understanding of things that, that people do not need. For instance, even personal needs are now lowering when people estimate it. In, in Russia, <clears throat> we have uh, 
uh, it, it is more complicated picture in, in Russia, of course, due to two factors, flow of propaganda on one side and the, the real life. People, are, of course, are, are more and more tired of the war. And uh, we, as a researcher, we are trying uh, to, f to find the hidden indicators, what's going on. Because, of course, since the beginning of the war, we have been waiting what factors could influence and could decrease the support of the war. For us, it was very important to find those factors. And uh, yes, we 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 can we uh, the support the support of the war looks very stable. The the direct answer to the very simple direct question, we never rely on it. Of course, segmentation uh, as 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 more complicated as possible is is our answer to those challenging situation with the understanding of people. Uh, uh, understanding of our respondents, but but now we we more and more in 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 a very different uh, uh, areas like uh, estimations of you know, changes in the in the ordinary life, uh, low lowering income, losing the jobs and uh, conflicts with the relatives and friends and other things. So they we we see that uh, it's 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 stable. But it's it's slowly, much more slow than we expected. It's slow declining of support. Uh, orally, uh, they say yes, we support. But when we go in depth, we see that it it, it is this support has become it's it's diss dissolving more and more. So that is the situation. So stability in Ukraine is is much higher in, in those optimism. Thank you, Elena, for helping with Russian opinion. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. uh, hey, uh, Hinek Yerabek from Charles University from Prague, from the Czech Republic. Uh, I agree with uh, what is behind the, the questions uh, until now, the development of public opinion. Yeah? This is the, the main interest of all of us. And I think if we ask for that, we can uh, ask all presenters, uh, some of them for Ukrainian public opinion development in the future, and uh, ask the other presenters uh, of the pro probably uh, development of public opinion in Russia. My questions could be there, therefore two. How to change public opinion in Russia if we trust that that is, that is measured perfectly or good? How to change? Contra propaganda, education, collaboration with Russia, war against Russia, economic actions against Russia, isolation of Russia, maybe something else. And the second, how to preserve the optimistic public opinion in Ukraine. Uh, that is uh, also important uh, for the future of Ukraine. Uh, it's up to you who, who would like to. Oh, to thank you. To, yeah. Okay, uh, let's move to the second part uh, about public opinion in Ukraine. Yeah, Tatiana, please. And maybe Alex will will answer about that. Uh, thank you very much for the question about Ukrainians. <laughs> so I will answer for that, I guess. And, uh, you know, the funny thing that uh, what Russia are doing itself, it's helping the Ukrainian uh, nation for unification. Like each rocket attacks, helps for the optimist maybe it's like not logical but it works and when uh, everything is calm you just uh, you can just forget that the war is going but each rocket attacks and like it was today it was uh, day before today uh ukrainians they start thinking more optimistic even when they have tough circumstances uh, so yeah, I guess maybe it's it's funny, but it still works like that. Also, another thing that Ukrainians, yes, they recognize that they have tough circumstances and like uh, bad economical situations, but they still believe like in victory. They still, if the Ukrainian armed forces they have some success, we have the optimistic. Uh, Values. Unfortunately, the only thing how we can influence this is to make donation to help the Ukrainian armed forces, and like, and and I guess that's it because the still war is uh, it's hard thing to know to play in it. 
and it's really a uh, really expensive thing to play in it that's why of course in one year i guess we will see also more decreasing uh, things about like economical situations about support of authority about optimism uh, but being in war still means being optimistic if you're staying in Ukraine. If you're staying in Ukraine during the war, you cannot be a, an optimist. Another, you need to move <laughs> move from your home. So that is, and we will try to manage all these things and to compare in one year again. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure. sure. Uh, maybe I want to add that um, according to our study, we, we saw that uh, Ukrainians... Uh, I expected from government uh, for changes of country. And if uh, people will see a real step that corruption uh, will, uh, we will fight against corruption, we will reform our judicial system, we will um, understand that everything in our country uh, changed in in best way, it will help us to uh, be optimistic. And I think it's the most important for Ukrainians uh, now. It's a trust to government and real steps of uh, uh, government. No. Thank you. Uh, maybe Sergei would like to say something about optimism and pessimism in Well, I, I think the main reason why we have such a high level of optimism is a high level of uh, our own state uh, value. So we reevaluate our state uh, and uh, we understand how important it is. Uh, when I um, when I had a, like uh, an idea to develop this GSR5 test, uh, the main reason was uh, social social political negativism in our society. So when we have such a high level of social political negativism, uh, the value of the state was uh, quite low. So what, now we understand its importance and we have high uh, value of it. So we have such a, a high optimism because uh, what we love, we wish uh, it uh, best luck. So I think um, when until we have... Uh, mm, good level of, of value of our state, we have a, a high level of, of optimism. This is the main reason. Uh, so another, another uh, like components, uh, authorities and um, conditions of life, uh, it's independent. So it's important uh, for us uh, like to keep optimism independent part in the religion of our state. That's my answer. Thank you. Thank you, Sergei. Okay, let's move on to the next questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. <clears throat> I have a question to Tatiana and Nika. So my concern is as follows. So uh, let's let's think one step ahead uh, when the war stops and the borders will be open. So as Nika presented, the main reason for the migrants to come back, specifically for women, is the relations probably with their husbands. So when the war stops, the borders will be open also, also for the male people. So what could be the anchors uh, not to, uh, so what would disincentivize people to go abroad when the war stops? Because I guess that the revelation that there may be economic um, development will be not as uh, strong, not as, um, yeah, let's say not as strong as the people expect right now. And probably at this moment, we already should start thinking uh, uh, thinking strategically ahead, how not to what what sh what incentive shall we give to Ukrainian people not to leave the country when the borders will be open? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, generally, we uh, you are right, and now we are thinking about the future, and uh, we even have uh, within this uh, research. Uh, we have also uh, part uh, from Ukrainians, and we ask them, uh, "What is your expe expectations if the war will end? Do you play, plan to return uh, to reunion with your family and uh, leave the country, or you expect that your family will ret uh, will return to Ukraine?" And and, and now we see that uh, large, uh, very small people who. 
uh, declares that they want to leave the country if it will be possible for men, for example. And uh, generally, uh, Ukrainians uh, still as a one nation, and even those who I brought and in Ukraine, they share s similar values. And their uh, um, responses to what they need in Ukraine is very similar. It's like a good job, a good job with a well paid, uh, uh, with good salaries. It's like economic situation and uh, uh, reforms. They want to uh, to to believe that Ukraine is European country, that it's not uh, without corruption. So it's it's uh, three. It's really very simple things, but it's very hard to achieve that. And uh, uh, that's why I I think it's so important to communicate with. Uh, uh, Ukrainians and uh, to show real steps. Uh, it's all. It's all depends on uh, Ukrainians and uh, uh, people and the government and as a uh, all organization. And now we have very very many um, um, uh, different programs in Ukraine that uh, uh, focused on developing country on, uh, and and uh, working with those problems that are in uh, in in country now. If Thank you. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks. And I will add a small remark that if you're talking about the reunion with your partner, for example, in our research, we saw that uh, like the desire to come back for your husband is a little bit weaker than the desire of your child. If you have a child of the school age to stay abroad for the future of your child. So sometimes people take uh, the this decision comparing not only for themselves, but for their children. So they want their children to study in Europe. They want their children to live in secure society in Europe. So uh, maybe it will be even a stronger factor rather than to go back home for the nation. And another thing is that uh, we know from our research that half of Ukrainians abroad, of Ukrainians in Europe, they already visited Ukraine during the war. So this migration and the open borders, it doesn't mean like going uh, to the end of your life. It means the short time migration. So they come to Ukraine, they live here for twice, two, three weeks, and then they go back to Europe. They live in Europe for half a year and then they go back to Ukraine. So it won't be like this in one moment. It is changing every week, uh, this migration waves. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your answers. I know that uh, coffee break is coming, but if you have uh, questions still and want to proceed, we can. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Christine Quirk. I'm a consultant. I do a great deal of work in Ukraine. And I would like to direct this question to uh, colleagues from rating. Uh, corruption has always been an issue in Ukraine, was a vulnerability of the president before the war, is a vulnerability of the president now, and is one of the major worries of Ukrainians about the future, as all of your data has shown. What do you see as the political impact of corruption during the wartime, how we're going, how that might affect support for Zelensky and perhaps emerging political forces. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, the issue that uh, uh, sure Ukrainians recognize that corruption is one of the biggest problem, but not all of them um, like connect to this problem with the president. Mostly they are thinking of the parliament, they are thinking of uh, deputies, and for people from the administration of the president, but doesn't mean the direct link to the president. That's why still a lot of those who think that corruption is a big problem, they doesn't think that Zelensky is uh, like obligatory to for that and uh, like the but another biggest problem is the reconstruction since the ukrainians see uh, the threat of the reconstruction and international financial support uh, of the reconstruction that this money can like can be used not that way what is like obligatory uh, that's why uh, that is why we want for some other institutions to make a control like because we don't believe that in ukraine ukrainian institution can make a good control for using this money uh, so i guess if it works that way it can be a little bit better for the reconstruction and using the financials uh, and from of course from the zelensky and from the administration president to fight uh, this uh, to make a steps 
us, uh, but firstly, not like himself, because he is have very positive images as a person, but his uh, office has not that good image, and maybe we should do something with that. Thank you. And uh, please, oh, raise your hand, please. Mm -hmm. Carrie Deschek from ICF and working with US Agency for International Development. Thank you very much for all this and, and for educating me. A more targeted question for you, I believe Tatiana, from the beginning, you showed some resilience index numbers. And I'd be interested to know what the tool was that you were using for that and what the components of resilience are. Also, if any other presenter has a comments on resilience. Sure, thanks. Yes, so we use uh, the uh, several uh, statements that people are assessing, like whether uh, it is uh, connected with them or the concern of this question or not. So, for example, if we have a physical resilience, it means like a good sleep, a good health, good feeling of themselves. Uh, and psychological, it's more about thinking of the future that I have. Uh, uh, I'm I'm communicating with people. I feel myself okay, and I don't think about the threats. Uh, so we have ten ten, ten uh, statements, like uh, six six or seven for the psychological and uh, four for the uh, physical uh, physical resilience. And for now, for example, uh, the 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 lowest one is that I feel myself good physical. It is the lowest one, and the 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 best one is that. Uh, I usually are interested in things, so I'm not an apathetic. I'm interested, I'm communicating with people, I'm looking for something inter interesting, and it helps to uh, to compare it uh, in the dynamics and to see how resilient people are. Uh, you can also uh, see it in our uh, site, like we have of uh, this resilience index, a lot of uh, different and more uh, comprehensive slides. Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, we'll proceed. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll stop uh, the part one now, and uh, take some coffee. And uh, thank you for this uh, collective discussion. And thank thank to our speakers. Yeah.